to that. And um, I must tell you about a few of the prices. Uh, you might be a little surprised comparing them with today. Um, the, of course, you know, you have to realize that uh, people didn't make the wages that they did today. Um, at one time, uh, uh, or the people that were working, like the men on the uh, waterfront, for instance, they worked for 80 cents an hour, and if they got three days a week at $19.20, they were well off. That was really, and your groceries would come to like $4 a week, something like that. That's hard to believe right now. But when I, even in my mother's store, pop, Ice cream, candy bars were five cents a piece. Lots of penny candy, three big hunks, three or four for a penny. And uh, bread was 11 cents a loaf, and milk 12 cents a quart. And they delivered to your door for that. And it was in a bottle with a, a little cardboard top. And on a cold morning, frosty morning, the cream was away up. The cap was a couple inches beyond the bottle. And also bananas were six cents a pound. And I can remember my little, mother's little candy store, the stock of bananas hung in the window, the whole big stock, and they just sell them right off the stock, you know. And nothing prepackaged like it is today. And my dad, he had a couple of horses and of course, you know, uh, uh, wood was hauled and all this in the early days with horses. There were no, he didn't own a truck until later and he had a business. So, but he was awful good to us, and uh, Sunday when my mother was tied up in the store, he'd take us kids for a drive, and uh, it was always a tour to nowhere. He would pretend he didn't know where he was going, and he loved to get on these back roads, and we'd have no idea when we were going, but he would, I'm sure he knew where he was going, but he used to pretend he didn't. Well, let's try this road, see what's down here. So then he'd say, we'd go by a cemetery, and he'd say, well, how many do you think are dead in there? We'd be guessing, and then we'd say, well, Dad, how do you know how many are dead? Well, they're all dead, <laughs> he'd say. Well, we used to get a big kick out of that. We were only little. And in the wintertime, he had a, a sort of a, they called it a sloven in those days. It was like a big uh, sled with runners on it. And there was sideboards built on it and seats, a seat built along each side. So you're sitting in this wagon, as it were, with facing one another. On, and the horse would haul us uh, over the snow and I used to way up to Pokeyock. I used to love to go up there. Somebody he knew there, we'd stop at their place and uh, the men would be playing cards and us kids would be playing in the snow and uh, then we'd, we'd be there most of the day. Of course it got dark early and then he'd bring us home with the horse but we loved those and we'd fight to sit in the back because the horse would grunt and complain going up the hill and uh, kick snow at us if you're up front. So we had great fun those days. And later on, years later when he was taking his own children on these little drives. He was always good to us kids. And um, later on when my children were small, my especially my eldest, Helen, uh, he would take her along because like Doreen, the middle girl, was a baby. So he'd leave, uh, he'd take Helen along just to uh, give me a break, I think. And he called her Tag Along. So Tag Along was his favorite. She always went with him with his other kids. So some of his family and mine were sort of related in age, which, as I say, we all grew up together, my kids and, and his. One of the girls was three years older than Helen. They were in the same class, and I have some school pictures of them together. And uh, So it was a memorable time. How did you celebrate Christmas and other holidays? Oh, when I was young, Christmas was quite different than it is today. Remember now, the men weren't making big wages, and uh, we, uh, you know, we didn't know any different. We thought we were well off because we had money coming in. So uh, the Christmas tree, we had to go out, cut your own tree and haul it in, and it was great fun doing that. Again, we went with the horse and the sled, and that was fun. My dad was great fun. And we had to... Um, uh, take a needle and coarse thread and thread popcorn to make big long ropes to trim the tree before the ornaments went on. Now some of the ornaments my mother had over the years and they all had a story. Every little thing that went on the tree had its own story. So 
What we got were, of course, we had to have clothes, things we needed. We got our clothes and we had one toy and our sock was full of fruit. We'd get an apple and an orange and whatever that was available for fruit. And we were always threatened, if you don't behave yourself, you get a lump of coal in your sock. That's all you'll get. And one year in particular, my uncle was um, laid off the railroad. And so he stayed with us over Christmas. And he had a habit of saying a few swear words now and again. So we'd remind him, now, Joe, you swear. You know what'll happen. So that year, sure enough, Joe got a big lump of coal in the sock. So we were hoping Joe learned a lesson, and we told him about it, you know. We were only kids. So that was great fun. <laughs> when did you first learn to drive? I first learned to drive when I was in my last year of high school. And uh, we had a car which was really wonderful compared to what the one we used to go take to the mirror machine when I was little and we had to crank it up. This had an automatic starter, I'll have you know. And also, uh, in those days, we had no um, signals or anything on, uh, on the cars. And, uh, of course, you know how they were always making fun of women drivers. That isn't something that just happened. It always was. And the women drivers were becoming more plentiful all the time. So... Um, when a woman put her hand out to signal, um, which we had to do, you, they would say, well, you never know whether she's going to make a turn or she's just drying her nail polish. <laughs> and that was the going uh, story at the time. So, uh, but um, in those days, let me see, uh, I, had, um, I had learned to drive, but uh, the brakes were mechanical and damp weather, they'd seize up. So St. John, as you know, is one hill and another. It's very hilly. And my father, uh, uh, when the day I got my license, we came out of the uh, uh, government office, and he, we had parked on a hill because there was all hills. And he said, well, now remember, you stay off of this street. <laughs> but there wasn't another that had, uh, without a hill. They were all the same way. So anyway, hills and brakes and all, I, that's how I got by driving. But I didn't have my own car until, oh, um, the children were small. I was married before we had a car. And uh, that's just the way things were, you know. Can you tell us about changes in lifestyle today? Oh, yes, I think there are quite a few changes, especially in technology. When I worked in um, the Telegraph Journal in the, uh, uh, you know, in the business, um, we had a wide open office, an open office, and each uh, department had like maybe four desks or something, for, and it was all open. And the bookkeeping was done by hand, so if you followed somebody else's handwriting, sometimes it wasn't easy. Lots of times you're trying to balance and uh, seven looks like something else. And um, in those days, um, uh, we had uh, the forerunner of the computer was a big, awkward-looking bookkeeping machine. And... Uh, it's hard for you to picture, I know, but it was operated by foot pedals, and I can recall that. And uh, then uh, we graduated from that rather quickly into the beginning of the computers, which were nothing like they are today. And we had to keep paper records as well, because with a power outage, you'd lost all your data. So... Uh, then uh, things began to change rapidly when the computers got improved so quickly each year. They were new and all. So then the office uh, scene changed. They um, were divided up into little offices with computers in each of them, and all the departments were separated and whatever. And that was just about the time I was getting out of there in the 70s when it started to really advance. And um, in fact, I think the offices were divided up after I had gone. And um, the other change that I saw was like before Medicare and that people take for granted today and Blue Cross, we had, um, I recall when my children were born uh, in St. Joseph's Hospital, maternity case was 12 days. You stayed in the hospital 12 days. And the cost was $30. Well, you had to save up that $30, and it took your, the, Time took time to do that, 
That doesn't seem possible today, but that's the way it was. Now, if you paid your $30 when you went in, you got it for $30, but otherwise it would cost you more if you were making payments. So anyway, my children were all born for $30. <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of the big changes to the Medicare. Can you tell us about raising your family? Um, yes. Um, my uh, family were used to pitching in and helping me. I always worked because my husband uh, lived with illness uh, for a long time. Their father lived with uh, illness. And um, so I always worked. But they were used to pitching in and helping out. So they were, you know, were pretty good that way. But um, uh, in high school, uh, my Helen, the oldest girl, she went into training for an RN in St. Joseph's Hospital. And in those days, it was quite different again than today because they had to spend three years working, actually working in the wards and uh, uh, at the hospital. And they got, um, I think the first year, they got $6 a month, and that was their pay. The second year, they got up to 8 and the third year, my oh my, they got $10 a month, which was big money. Wouldn't keep them in toothpaste. <laughs> I was happy I was working. There was always something cropping up, you know. And um, so anyway, Helen uh, did well with it, and it was really her chosen career, and she loved it. And she worked a good many years. She met, uh, she met her husband, um, uh, Dr. Mike Jennings' son in St. John, and uh, Michael, and uh, he went. Uh, he was a doctor also, and went in for um, his his specialty was anesthesia. And uh, while he was, uh, they were married while he was studying and doing. Uh, he did five years um, in preparation for his um, license. And they lived at that time a couple of years in uh, Vancouver, and they lived in Ontario mainly because that's where he uh, finally uh, set up. Uh, he didn't do, go into private practice. He was uh, attached to a hospital up there. But Michael died when he was only 70, and uh, Helen was left by herself. But she's always worked and um, loved her career and very compassionate person and whatever. So I was proud of her. And Doreen, the second daughter, she um, went in for business, and uh, she did, in uh, school, she did the business uh, course instead of the regular, and she worked in business until her, she has, a, a, her son was adopted, and he, uh, when he was small, she stayed home with him, and then went to work later on, and uh, when she went back, she decided that the, um, the office scene had changed, so she felt as though she were old. <laughs> so she got into another uh, career in the nursing also. So she did home care and whatever and uh, when she finished her course. And uh, so she had a career in nursing as well. And then my son, my baby, he went into, uh, he was going to, during high school we made a deal. Okay. They were working part-time in uh, one of the grocery stores, packing groceries, whatever, after school like kids do. And so I said to him, now, uh, remember, well, there wasn't a whole lot of money, but they all had to be educated. So I uh, made him a bargain. If you, for every dollar you save, I'll match it, and we'll save enough to get you to college. If you get a year, you get enough for your first year, we'll worry about the, the rest. Okay, we had a deal. And I'm telling you, sometimes it was like drawing your right teeth, get that, you know, couple of dollars, and I'd match what they'd save. The other girls did, too. And... Um, Anyway, by the time he hit uh, grade 12, he uh, had his mind changed. He um, said, you know, I'd like to um, join the RCMP. So I thought, well, you know, it's your life. You've got to do what you want to do. And he really felt that he would like to do that. So I said, well, we make another deal. You go join the RCMP, and we give you one year. And if uh, you don't like it, you don't stay back to college, you go, we'll have a little more money. Okay, uh, that was a deal. So he went to out west, did his training. He was, um, they were at that time trained about 10 months. And they had the musical ride and all those things. And I had a trip out west before the graduation. They had a passing out, cer passing out ceremony, they called the graduation. So I was out there for that and I enjoyed that. I made a lot of friends. 
Yeah. Anyway, he came home and he was all gung ho. He was uh, stationed in Nova Scotia, different parts of Nova Scotia, the whole career, and decided uh, he's going to stay. So I said, okay. So he buys his first car with his college money. <laughs> That's what started him up with the first car, and he was stationed in Nova Scotia. So he stayed 23 years, and then he bought his own business. He and a, another chap bought a business, and um, he, uh, oh, after a couple of years, he bought the other chap out. So he had his own business for 20 years, too, and now he's retired. In fact, my kids are all retired. So that, where does that put me? <laughs> sort of uh, in the background. Now they're telling me what to do, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you understand that you have Although something to read to us about changes you have seen. Uh, yes, I've run across this little um, note among my memoirs, and uh, it seems to sum up what we've been talking about. I'll read it to you and hope I don't bore you. Um, we are survivors. Consider all the changes we have witnessed. We were born before television, before penicillin, before polio shots, frozen foods, Xerox, plastic, contact lenses, frisbees, and the pill. We were born before radar, credit cards, split atoms, laser beams, and ballpoint pens, before pantyhose, dishwashers, clothes dryers, electric blankets, air conditioners, drip dry clothes, and before man walked on the moon. We got married first and then lived together. How quaint can you be? In our time, closets were for clothes, not for coming out of. Bunnies were small rabbits, and rabbits were not Volkswagens. Designer jeans were scheming girls named Jean or Jeannie, and having a meaningful relationship meant getting along with your cousins. We thought fast food was what you ate during Lent, and outer space was the back of a theater. We were born before house husbands, gay rights, computer dating, dual careers, and computer marriages. We were born before daycare centers, group therapy, and nursing homes. We never heard of FM radio, tape decks, electric typewriters, artificial hearts, word processors, yogurt, and guys wearing earrings. For us, time-sharing meant togetherness, not computers and condominiums. A chip meant a piece of wood, hardware meant hardware, and software wasn't even a word. In 1940, made in Japan meant junk, and the term making out referred to how you did on an exam. Pizzas, McDonald's, and instant coffee were unheard of. We hit the scene when there were five and ten cent stores when you bought things for five and ten cents. For a nickel, you could ride a streetcar, make a phone call, buy a Coke, or enough stamps to mail one letter and two postcards. You could buy a Chevy Coupe for $500, but who could afford one? Pity, because our gas was 11 cents a gallon. In our day, cigarette smoking was fashionable. Grass was mowed. Coke was a cold drink. Pot was something you cooked in. Rock music was grandma's lullaby, and aides were helpers in the principal's office. We were certainly not born before the difference between the sexes was discovered, but we were surely more sex changes. But we were surely before sex change. We made do with what we had. We were the last generation that was so dumb as to think you needed a husband to have a baby. No wonder we are so confused and there was such a generation gap. But we survived. And what better reason to celebrate? I will record a legacy of history project. Thanks to you for sharing your life stories and memories with us. It was my pleasure. A trip down